thanks everybody for coming out today. We're going to do a really awesome hour on uh, billing and coding. Everybody's favorite thing, right? Really exciting. Um, we have with us today Dr. Eric Botts. I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself to get us started. A uh, lot of expertise, some really good information coming your way. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am a practicing optometrist for 25 years. I'm also the third party trustee for the Illinois Optometric Association. Uh, and that kind of forces me to, to learn quite a bit about third party billing coding. I also own a company, uh, it's called Optometric Billing Consultants, that uh, does credentialing and submission of claims for optometrists. Uh, we have uh, well over a thousand clients, so lots of experience with submitting claims, uh, credentialing, coding, everything that goes with it. Fantastic. And I'm Dr. Patricia Fulmer. I work with covalentcareers.com and uh, newgradoptometry.com, and I also am in private practice in Alabama. So we're going to have a great talk today, but let's dive right in. Um, you know, billing and coding is not always the most exciting topic. It's not the most sought after topic, but it's probably one of the most important topics, I would say, within your practice to run a successful and audit free practice. So. Getting into that, new graduates when they come out of school maybe aren't the most prepared on that side of things. Um, what can they do leading up to graduation to make sure that they really have a handle on billing and coding? Well, first I'd say is if they offer any kind of coding and billing course work in school, I, I would take anything that you can get. My understanding is, is they don't offer a lot. Um, and so you're probably going to have to go outside of your school to get information. If you could get to a coding and billing course uh, performed by an a, a optometrist, I think that would be your best bet. Otherwise, uh, you know, you, could, you can start by coding the exams you're doing in school. I think that might be a start. Or when you're doing your internships, um, coding the exams that you're performing, uh, getting some experience uh, with that. Uh, reading the 1997 uh, evaluation and management guidelines would give you some information on, on how to, to do the coding, so that might be a good place to start. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of trial and error, uh, learning as you go. Absolutely. I think learning as you go is a big thing and, and knowing that you're going to make a couple of mistakes. But let's say a new graduate's just gotten out, they're hired on, they're an associate, they're a little nervous, they're going to make a, a couple of mistakes and mess up something for the practice. What's some ways that they can get comfortable once they're in practice with billing and coding so that they're not, you know, quite so timid in that area? So the, the best thing I could suggest is you really familiarize yourself with, with how to determine what's, what's a 99 level office visit, um, what, what's a 92 level office visit, uh, what, what elements of the exam uh, are included in those. So educating yourself is, is your best bet. Um, I, I think one of the, the, the biggest uh, concerns I see with, with optometrists, not just new grads, but, but, but just about any grad, uh, no matter how many years you've been out, is understanding the difference between medical and routine. I think you, you need to really make some emphasis to understand the difference between the two and make sure that you're not submitting a, a medical exam uh, to a routine insurance. I completely agree. Um, so you touched a little bit on it, 92 codes and 99 codes. Why don't we dive into that a little bit more? What actually constitutes a 99 code? What can I bill for that if I see a patient who comes in for their yearly exam, but maybe I find three different, you know, disease diagnoses? Which direction do I go? Is a 92 code still appropriate, or should I go 99? So great question. I think what what you have to decide first of all is are you doing a, a medical exam or are you doing a, a routine or healthy wellness exam? That will help you to determine whether or not you're using a 92 code or not. Uh, 92 codes are, are, are basically for the, the routine exams because you cannot submit a refractive diagnosis with a 99 code uh, to, to any insurance and get paid. So first you establish if you're doing a, a routine exam, then you're gonna use the 92 codes. If it's a medical exam, then you really can do either. You can use 99 or you can use 92. How to differentiate when do you use one versus the other um, is a great question. Uh, and, and there's a couple different ways to, 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 to answer it. Number one, some codes are going to pay more than others, even though you, you meet the requirements for, say, example, a 99204 and a 92004. Those are both four-level exams for new patients. Uh, the criteria for the exam is very, very similar. 
And if you've met it for both, then you have the choice of submitting either for a medical exam with a medical diagnosis. The 92004 is gonna pay less than a 99204. So if you wanna be reimbursed the full amount, then I would submit it as a 99204. On the other hand, if it's an established patient and you're comparing the 99214 uh, and the 92014, then realize that the 92014 is actually gonna pay a higher reimbursement than the 99214. Um, so if you're looking at reimbursement, then, then that's one way to, de to determine the, the difference between the two. Great points. Um, you know, a lot of patients don't come in and say, I'm here to get my dry eye checked. I'm here to get my glaucoma checked. They may if they know that's a pressure check or whatever. But let's say it's a yearly exam and they, they have VSP and they're there and they just say, I'm here for my yearly exam. I want to get my eyes checked. And you find these things, you decide you want to go 9-9. Do you need to change your chief complaint? So the chief complaint drives the exam. Uh, you, you really uh, look at that chief complaint to determine what type of exam you're performing. If a patient comes in and says, I'm looking for new glasses today, and that's the only, only complaint they have, more than likely you're doing a routine exam that day because it is going to be driven by the chief complaint. Absolutely. So are there any online resources that you know of that the ODs can reference, you know, quickly to kind of figure some of this stuff out? So online, um, I think a, a great resource is uh, CMS.gov. It has a lot of uh, information on it. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, you, you'd have to read through a lot of policies and procedures on that website, um, which, which is why most doctors are not fully informed on, on all, all that uh, is involved in the coding and billing. Uh, the only people that really read all the information are geeks like myself who, who read it and teach it. But that is one very, very good uh, website that you could go to, has a lot of good information. Uh, I would also Google uh, the, the 1997 evaluation and management uh, guidelines, because if you can read that from, from front to back, uh, multiple times and understand it completely, then then coding your exam is, is definitely gotten a whole lot easier. Great. We mentioned earlier that sometimes you do make a mistake when you do this. What would you say are the top three billing mistakes that you see new graduates or really any OD making? I would say the, the number one mistake I see are, are doctors who are submitting the uh, uh, medical eye examination to a routine insurance plan. Um, I, I think that is, is a huge mistake made every day, um, and, and so that's, that's one thing I would definitely uh, be, be trying to avoid. How you use your modifiers is, is also uh, probably the, the next biggest mistake that I see doctors make. There's, there's so many different modifiers out there that you have to use. Uh, by definition, they're designed to make your claim uh, more specific. But the reality of it is modifiers are probably the number one reason that you're going to get a claim uh, denied. Uh, so I think understanding modifiers is, is absolutely critical. And then the other mistake I think most doctors make is, is in the credentialing process. Um, number one, not credentialing soon enough. Uh, submitting claims before you're credentialed for an insurance is, is an automatic uh, denial. Or credentialing improperly. Uh, not not uh, having yourself set up either as a corporation or as an individual using both individual and uh, group MPI numbers if you have it. Using all of that correctly is probably the other mistake that most uh, doctors make. So a couple of follow-up questions to what you just mentioned. Modifiers first. Um, are there a handful of those that, that an OD should really be familiar with that you would recommend starting with getting yourself familiar, knowing how to bill or code those specific ones? Uh, yes, I, I definitely think if you're doing uh, uh, any procedures, uh, supplementary tests that are unilateral, you need to understand how to use the right, the left, the E1, E2, E3, E4 for the, the different lids. So, so those codes definitely uh, go with, with the procedure codes. A 25 modifier and, and 24 modifier I think are also codes that you're going to utilize fairly regularly. Um, the 25 modifier is, is when you're doing uh, two procedures on the same day that are unrelated. 
Uh, I think it's also a modifier that is probably overused and, uh, and incorrectly or improperly used uh, quite often. 24 modifier is, is when you're using uh, or when, when you're performing uh, an examination during the global period of a previously performed surgical procedure, uh, use a 24 modifier with the office visit in order to get reimbursed uh, for that office visit. Um, 55 modifier is, is a modifier that's used with uh, post-op care when you're doing cataract surgery. Um, 79 modifier is used with also post-op care when you're doing the second eye during the, the global period of the first eye. Um, those are probably the most commonly used uh, modifiers. You said 25 is probably the most overused. Can you give an example of a way to properly use that code? So the 25 modifier is typically used with, with surgical codes uh, when you're performing an office visit on the, on the same day. For example, you, if, you, if you have a patient coming in who, who's uh, perhaps uh, you're epilating a lash, um, but the, but they they come in complaining and having other issues besides just the uh, trachiasis. Uh, you would use the 25 modifier with the office visit, uh, as well as the, tr the the epilation procedure at the same time. If you don't use the 25 modifier with the office visit, the office visit is going to get denied. How about those patients that come in? You know, I've got metal in my eye or the pine straw just flew in my eye or something like that, and they come in and, and they truly do have a, a foreign body. You remove it. Are you then allowed to bill an office visit and the removal of that foreign body? For, for a foreign body, I'll just tell you the answer is no. You're only going to do a foreign body removal procedure only, just a surgical procedure, no office visit uh, the same day. However, I will tell you that there's no, no global period associated with that procedure. So the next day when you see them, you can bill an office visit the, the day after or, or whenever you see them next. Is there any problem with the bandage contact lens code on top of the, the foreign body removal? The bandage contact lens code shouldn't be an issue at all. So how can an OD make sure that they're not over or under coding? We hear a lot that you know, you're know you going to get audited if you build too much of this or too much of that. And now so many of the insurances are starting to ga gauge you and send you letters saying you're prescribing or coding this code way more than your colleagues or way less than your colleagues. How do you know that you're staying in the right realm so if you do get audited, then you're okay? So uh, one thing that I put together, is, it's one of the forms that I, I passed out earlier, um, is basically a, a form I use for, for audits or learning how to code and bill. And, and basically, you just need to pay attention to the details. You need to look at what kind of, of history you performed, how many elements of the exam you, you did, and, and what your level of decision making is. And if you follow the 1997 evaluation management uh, guidelines uh, to a T, uh, you, you shouldn't have any issue uh, overcoding or undercoding. Along with that, though, you have to make sure you're documenting. If you, if you don't document it, you didn't do it. So you, you don't get credit for anything you don't write down. So make sure you review your exam and make sure you're, you're documenting everything accurately. And when you're all done, go back and, and, uh, and look at what you did, uh, count up how many elements of the, the history you did, how many elements of the exam, uh, decide on your decision making, and then decide what level of exam you performed. Purposely undercoding, uh, thinking that maybe you would not be audited is just as wrong as overcoding. Correct coding is the only accurate way to submit a, a claim. So what's the easiest way to make yourself a target for an audit? Well, fortunately, optometrists really aren't getting audited to the degree that other professionals are. I mean, we, there, there are some audits taking place out there, um, but, but I, I personally have never been audited. I, 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 I actually look forward to the day that I am so I can answer that question a whole lot better so that I would know exactly what they're looking for. I suspect a lot of it has to depend, has to do with exactly who's auditing your, your exams and what are they looking for. Um, I think that's going to uh, really uh, be the focus uh, for any audit that you undergo. I think more concerning is some of the audits you're getting perform that are being performed by, by the routine insurance panels. I think those, those audits are probably more financially devastating to optometrists than say a Medicare or a Blue Cross Blue Shield audit. Uh, fortunately, most optometrists are not 
purposefully or fraudulently submitting claims, they make mistakes, it's, it's typically not on purpose. And so most audits result in, in mistakes found um, and, and, and not so much financial uh, penalty because a lot of the mistakes we are made are, are, are not purposefully made. So when you mention routine care, you mean like VSP audits and things of that nature? Yeah. So I know a lot of us would love to not have to deal with the billing coding at all and just hand that off to somebody in our practice. And, and a lot of times when doctors get a practice that's big enough, they do kind of start to move that direction, um, whether it be scribes in a room or texts or you know having the, a billing person separate within their office. Who should really be doing the billing and coding, and is there a difference between the actual coding in the room and, and billing out to the insurance company? Okay, so, so several questions there. Let, let's start with the coding and billing. Uh, coding needs to be performed by the doctor. The doctor's the expert. The doctor is the one where the buck stops. You should be deciding what CPT codes you're using, what procedure codes you're using, what what any codes you're using should be should be documented by the doctor. The actual submission of the of the claims um, should actually can actually be performed by by a staff member, uh, the doctor, or or you can outsource to a billing service. It should be submitted by somebody who knows what they're doing, and and that's where the complexity of of submitting insurance claims really comes into play. Is is the fact that there are so many. Um, rules that, that you have to follow and, and unfortunately every insurance company can, can do things differently so it's not even as if you have to learn one set of rules you have to learn how one, one insurance panel wants it submitted and you have to learn how another insurance panel wants it submitted and they're not always the same um, so whoever's doing it needs to be well trained well educated on whatever the, the state you're, you're practicing it in and whatever insurance panels you're, you're submitting to, really understand what's, what's necessary in order to get a claim submitted uh, and for the doctor to get, get reimbursed. Because understand, your, your, your submission of insurance claims, it's, it's all about cash flow. It's all about keeping cash flow in your practice, keeping reimbursements coming in. When you're not getting your claims submitted accurately, you're not getting paid. So can I resubmit a claim? Let's say it comes back, it's denied. Can I resubmit it, or is that it? Absolutely. If you if you have a claim that's denied, um, oftentimes they'll give you a reason why, um, and that's the first clue as to how to resubmit it. But sometimes they need a little bit of research. Um, but you can resubmit the claim uh, and and typically get reimbursed the full amount. There's no penalty for getting it wrong. So let's say you've handed that part off in your practice to somebody. They're, they're dealing with the insurances, the EOBs, everything like that. What, is there a benchmark or something that you can look at, at the, as the doctor, knowing how much they're bringing to you to say, can we write this off, to know whether or not they're working those claims diligently or if they're maybe just submitting the first time and saying, okay, oh, well. So this is where a, an EMR really comes into play because if you have a good EMR, that will keep track of your accounts receivables and, and you know that number is rising, then you absolutely can see uh, what claims are, are being processed, uh, what claims are being denied. Your, your accounts receivable uh, should, should not uh, be growing every single month. It should be a stable number. You're always gonna have accounts receivable because a lot of insurances take up to several months to pay. And so your accounts receivable is always going to be a number. The busier you are, the higher the number is. But it shouldn't be growing every month. Is there a target number that practices should look for regarding their accounts receivable or AR? I would be more focused on, on the 90-day accounts receivables. And I probably would not want to see that number maybe go over 20% of, of your total gross uh, in, in, a, in a year's time. What are your thoughts on, on practices who collect up front to try to you know, minimize the account receivable versus waiting and billing on the back end? Well, if, if you are a provider for an insurance panel, you have to follow the contract. And in, in a lot of cases, if you're the provider, you can't collect up front. It's only if you're a non-participating provider for Medicare that you can actually collect the day of the exam. If you're a participating provider accepting assignment, you have to submit the claim. You can collect the deductible amount um, or co-pays 
at, uh, on the day of service, but the rest of the exam fee needs to be processed and then paid by the insurance. Great. Are there any insurances that you would say, you know, say a new, new graduate's out or somebody opening a new practice, is there, you know, a core group of insurances that they really should be making sure they're credentialed on and paneled and, and making sure that they're able to submit claims to those insurances? So a lot of that depends on where you practice, what state you practice in. Unfortunately, not all states are equal. Some states, uh, for example, Florida has their Blue Cross Blue Shield pretty much uh, shut off to new optometrists. Very hard to get onto Blue Cross Blue Shield. But if you practice in, in many other states, getting on Blue Cross Blue Shield, not an issue at all. Um, I would say Medicare is, is probably the, the most non-discriminatory insurance panel out there. I absolutely would be a Medicare provider. Uh, it's probably the biggest um, insurance beneficiary uh, out there today. Um, over over probably 40, 50 million recipients. So it's a huge insurance. So Medicare would be one. I think Blue Cross Blue Shield is, if you can get on the panel, and most states you can, I, I definitely look at, at Blue Cross Blue Shield. As a new grad, building a practice, having seats in your chair, Medicaid is probably an easy way to get patients in your chair. It just doesn't reimburse uh, as, as well. And then you gotta pick and choose your, your routine vision plans. Um, you need to look at the contract and see if you can afford to practice for the amount they're going to reimburse and pick, pick those. Primarily, I tell doctors to, to look at who are the major employers in your community and what insurances do they uh, provide their, their employees. Those are the insurances I would go after. That's a great point. So let's switch gears just a little bit. We're going to talk about everybody's really favorite thing, macro MIPS, all the, the other government regulations that are coming down the pipeline. Can you kind of touch on what, what those are? are? Is there a difference in macro and MIPS? What, what are we looking at when we're hearing all these acronyms? Okay, so, so realize that th this really started uh, several years ago uh, with, with PQRS, um, evolved into meaningful use, and then in 2015, the uh, MACRA law was passed, and, and that's what resulted in, in MIPS, the, the merit-based incentive payment system that we are dealing with in 2017. That system is, is in place today. Uh, it's going to affect your reimbursement in two years. Uh, so, so I think uh, you, you have to participate. Um, you have to play ball with, with the, uh, the MIPS program if you want to get full reimbursement on your Medicare. So what if I choose not to be a Medicare provider? Does that mean I can just forget all this exists? So if, if you're not a Medicare provider, it, it really won't affect you at all. Uh, in fact, um, if you are a Medicare provider and you charge out more, less than $30,000 in Medicare uh, billings in a 12-month in a period of time, you, you won't be affected by the MIPS program. You'll automatically get the full reimbursement in 2019. If you are a first year Medicare provider, you don't have to participate. And if you see less than 100 Medicare patients in, in a 12 month period of time, then you also won't have to participate. And, and what I mean by that is, is you're gonna get full reimbursement for Medicare without uh, attesting or, or reporting anything uh, on, in, in the MIPS program. So how, you touched on attesting, how does an OT go about attesting? Do they have to, you know, if they, if they know they're under 100, but they do take Medicare, do they still have to go on and accept out of everything or can they just not do it? So if, you, if you're in one of the three groups that I just said were exempt, you, you don't have to attest. So I'll just repeat it. If, if you see less than 100 patients that are on Medicare, if you bill out less than $30,000, or if you're a first time Medicare provider, you don't have to attest. Um, a testing for 2017 um, will actually not start until January 1st of 2018. Um, currently, the, the program that you're going to use to, to a test is, is I think it's currently under construction because I, I looked at it just earlier this week uh, to, to see if the, if the test station was possible. And, and you can only get so far and then it stops. So, my understanding is, is they're, they're building it still for 2018. It's probably different than what we used uh, to a test for 2016. That's interesting. Not surprising that they're behind, but interesting. Um, how, 
can an OD navigate these new requirements as they change year to year? They build on, on themselves and on each other. So, you know, are there a few maybe top three ways that they can kind of figure out exactly what is required of them? So I, I, I would tell you the, the, the best thing you could do um, and, and the, the resource that I depend on most often is probably the American Optometric Association. I mean, that's what they're there for is for optometrists. So uh, if you're a member of your state association and a member of the American Optometric Association, you're probably getting a lot of the information through that association that, that you need. Unfortunately, what we need to do in 2018 may not be divulged to us until November, December of this year. That's the unfortunate part about all this is it is still under development. And so it's not like they're ready to go uh, at the beginning of the year. It's taking them time to put things together. You mentioned the CMS site earlier. Is that a good resource for them as well to, to go on and figure out exactly what the requirements are? Or would you say stick to more of the AOA based? The, the CMS.gov website has all the information there. I, I think you can go there. You can, if you can search through all the information that's there, and there's a lot of it, you will find the answers. It's just a question of whether or not you have the patience to go read through all that information. Going back a little bit to, to billing within your office, if you decide to um, source out your billing and use like a third-party billing agency, what are the risks involved when it comes to these these sort of credentials? You know, I know we're not billing things exactly the same like we did with PQRS and things of that nature, but is there any risk involved with using like a third party for your billing when you're also dealing with meaningful use and macro and all of that? Are they completely separate? So there really should not be any issues whatsoever. Whatever billing service you use should be well educated on, on how to submit the claims, utilizing um, whatever resources are necessary to submit the uh, the MIPS uh, requirements. So, uh, in fact, they're they're probably better educated on how to submit uh, the claims correctly. How do you get your staff on board with it? With with the the coding for like macro and everything. You know, a lot of this has to do with did they click the right thing in their workup? Did they ask the right questions for glaucoma or macular degeneration? So. You know, it's it's really uh, getting them to buy into how this is is playing out. Um, you 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 really need to educate them on on why the the macro system exists. Um, even though you might not necessarily agree with everything that uh, uh, is is being implemented, um, these are the 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 hoops that we have to jump through. Um, the doctor just needs to take charge of the staff and, and say, this is, this is the way we're going to do it. But I will tell you, it really starts with the doctor. I think the doctor leads by example. The doctor should be doing the coding. For example, uh, when, when, I, when I was doing PQRS, I always added the, all of my own codes to my, to my claims. Uh, it shouldn't necessarily always be the staff's responsibility. When it comes to coding, it, it really falls on the doctor. The doctor needs to take responsibility for it. So where do you see all of this going in the future? You know, we, you hear the conversation about healthcare reform day in and day out. We know that things are changing every single day in Washington. So where do you see it in five, 10 years or even next year? Well, I can tell you one thing. It, it's, it's not going away. It is going to be here. It's going to be here in some shape or form. That's sad. Uh, <laughs> but, it, but it's not going away. Decrease in your reimbursement is going to go lower and lower. Um, you know, the, the one thing I've learned with, with, with all of this since, since PQR started, Meaningful Use, is they typically dangle the carrot, some slight reimbursement incentive to get you to do what they want you to do, um, and then that diminishes, and then they give you a much bigger penalty if you don't. Uh, and I can only see that the penalty is going to go higher. So I, I really think y y you have to play ball. Um, if, if you don't have an EHR in your practice, it, it's, it's time to, to get one, uh, simply because a lot of what's going to happen with MIPS would require you to have an EHR in your practice. Absolutely. Um, you touched on the penalties a second ago. Can you kind of review what penalties we know are coming in the next few years and then where you think that may go from here on? So the way it works is, is whatever you perform in 2017 
is going to dictate either incentive or penalty in 2019. So there's a two-year uh, lag behind uh, the, the reimbursement or, or penalty. In 2019, if you don't perform MIPS correctly this year, um, and, and the good news is in 2017, the MIPS program really only requires you to report one quality measure on one patient. So one quality measure on one patient in, in the whole year will get you the full reimbursement from Medicare. Totally if you don't do that, that way, right? <laughs> if you don't do that, then you're going to lose 4%. That'll be an automatic 4% uh, reduction in your Medicare reimbursement. Unless, like I said, unless you're exempt from the program. That 4% is going to go up over, the, over the, the next few years after that. And also realize that I think the, the increases in Medicare reimbursement are going to end, uh, I believe, after this year or, or next. There will be no more increases in Medicare reimbursement. So the only way you're going to get a, a boost in revenue from Medicare is by performing the MIPS program uh, correctly. It's kind of scary when you think about, you know, cost of living adjustments and things of that nature. So if we're not getting any more incentives, we're not getting any more adjustments and increases in Medicare reimbursement, we're getting penalized if we don't meet these, how do we stay in business? So, so if you perform the, the program at a really high level in 2017, you'll get a 4% increase in 2019. Unfortunately, I think that's going to go to a very small number of doctors. And realize that, that the MIPS program is a neutral budget program, which means for every doctor that gets a bonus, somebody's going to have a penalty. They're not going to spend any more money on Medicare reimbursement uh, going forward. So, so the only way you're going to get a boost is to, to perform at a high level. And for everybody who does, somebody is going to get... Uh, a, a smaller paycheck for Medicare. And by that, I'm taking that you mean basically if you and I are practicing, Medicare is going to look at what I did and what you did and compare the two. And if I did a whole lot better or you did a whole lot better, that person gets the 4% increase in the other, depending on how much worse, maybe neutral, or might be that 4% reduction. Is that right? So, so the MIPS is scored on a 0 to 100 and how you score, what number your score is, will determine where you fall uh, and, and what kind of reimbursement you're going to get. So you'll be scored and, and realize that that score uh, very possibly will be uh, shown to the public. So, so there's one more reason if, if you feel like your patients are going to pay attention to this, that you, you probably need to do the best you can. Uh, score as high as you can uh, for, for that reason alone. So you touched on EMR and how important that is. If I'm going out and I'm going to buy an EMR system for my office now, what are some things that I need to look at in the system to make sure that it's going to be, you know, compatible with these things and user friendly? So, first things I'm, I'm I would tell you to look at is is uh, what kind of internet you have, um, because if you don't have a strong internet, then uh, if you don't have a high speed. Then, then going to a cloud-based EHR is going to be a struggle. If you have a good internet, then, then there's lots of different plant programs out there that are good, that, that uh, are cloud-based or server-based. Then you have the choice, if, if, if you have a good internet, that you could do cloud-based. The reality of it is there is no EHR out there that's going to make everybody happy. That, that's the reality of it. Some are much, much better than others, and some are much better at different things like some are really good for coding and billing um, if, if you asked uh, I have uh, I currently have at OBC I have 44 full-time coding uh, or, or billing specialists and if I took a poll of the of those that do EMR they would they would definitely tell you which is their favorites and which are their least favorites based on billing or, or submitting claims if you ask me from the doctor standpoint I also will have a, a uh, preference as to which one I like best uh, as far as documenting the examination. And some of them are good at both, and some of them are good at one or better at the other. Um, so uh, I suggest you demo 
whatever you're interested in and, and find out what's going to work best for your practice. But I do think you've got to look at the internet speed if you want to do a, a, a cloud-based EHR. Do you think there's any benefit saying the internet is, you know, up to speed? Is there a benefit of doing a cloud-based, you know, EHR over a regular non-cloud-based? So the benefits of, of a, a cloud-based is, is that you don't have to put as much into your IT uh, since you're more focused on using their servers, um, their remote servers. So there's probably some savings there. Is there any security risk involved in using cloud-based EHR? Sometimes I hear ODs talk about being a little bit afraid of that sort of side of things. So, uh, you know, there's risk at whatever you do. I, I'm assuming that most of the cloud-based EHRs have, have a, a very good secure system in place. Um, and really any more, a server, if you have a server base and you're using a good IT uh, company, uh, you, you should you should be even you should be good in your own office. That's not to say that breaches won't happen. Um, breaches are going to happen, um, and and so, uh, but but honestly, that that's that's another conversation. You touched on um, Medicare, you know, comparing and, and using the MIPS scores and all those sort of things. Do you ever see a point in time that we may come to where they start to drop? ODs or, or doctors in general from their panels if they're not performing in these systems? I think that's definitely a concern, um, especially since the, the number of ODs that are actually doing uh, PQRS, for example, in 2016 dropped significantly from previous years, like from uh, down to like 15%, I think is the number, um, which, is, which is really, really low. Uh, in comparison to what what happened previously, uh, part of that is because optometrists took advantage of the of the really big reimbursement uh, incentives, like uh, uh, sixty five thousand dollars for for uh, for Medicare uh, or Medicaid uh, incentives. Um, once that was done, I think a lot of doctors dropped out. I also think that they changed the program uh, with PQRS, made it more complicated for optometrists to be successful. This year, it's actually easier than last year. So I think they realize the mistakes they've made. I think they're trying to, to make it doable for everybody. But I do think if we don't participate on a, on a large uh, number, that yes, it's, it's going to come back to, to haunt us. I think that's a good point. You know, sometimes they do put out these guidelines and we get overwhelmed by them. And then a couple months later, maybe they pull a few of those back. Uh, we saw it big time with stage two meaningful use when they reconfigured that. Um, is that something that you would, you know, kind of stress to, to an OD who maybe is getting a little overwhelmed in the in the thought of the coming years that we're all overwhelmed? You know, it's not not just them. Absolutely. It, it is an overwhelming process on top of everything else that you're trying to do. Frustration for me is that I don't know that it really improves my patient care all that much. So, so that's frustrating for me. It's, it's the hoop we've got to jump through. So it's not going away. We, we have to move forward. Um, even if you attempt and you don't uh, succeed, um, at least... The, the next year you might be better at it. So, so I would tell you, at least give it your best shot. Um, you might not succeed the first year, but, but you've got lots more years to be successful. So I think you, you at least got to attempt at some level uh, uh, performing the MIPS program. And, and really this year, uh, it, it's the, the, the bar is set so low, there's, there's absolutely no reason for anybody not to, to, to perform uh, at, 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 at a level that, that will be successful. Surely we can all get one measure on one patient, right? So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the floor, see if we have any questions. Um, does anybody have anything they want to ask? Any questions? Just a refresher. Um, the 9-9 codes, do they require more decision-making than the 9-2 codes? So the 9-9 codes have real, real set requirements very specific that's the 1997 evaluation and management uh, uh, guidelines so so in that respect it's it's pretty black and white the 92 codes um, are, are are probably more more vague probably easier to to document uh, in a lot of ways um, because they are less rigid um, so 
I don't know. Does that answer your question? You gave a handout out earlier that has um, kind of some check boxes that you can look at for those sort of things. You mentioned internal audits and things of that nature. Is that also maybe a guide that, that doctors can have in their practice to just quickly reference when they're between do I do a 9-2 or a 9-9 or do I meet that level of a 9-9 code? So, so some of the tools that I gave you there, um, one of them is, is, a, is a document I use to determine. I, uh, basically, I would use it as, as an audit and as a, an instruction for, for going forward to make sure you're, you're, you're coding uh, your exams correctly. It makes it pretty simple to, to outline what level of history you perform, what level of, of exam you perform, and what decision making. I think those tools are things that you need to constantly use, uh, not only to go back and audit maybe 10 exams that you've performed in the last two or three months to make sure you coded them correctly, but also going forward. I think once you internalize how to correctly code your exams, those, those tools aren't as necessary to use. But, but for most of us, until we get uh, you know, really good at it, we probably need to use every crutch we can. The other tools I gave uh, is a coding book that I put together. And, and I think what's, what's really nice about the coding book is, is that it has the, the uh, diagnosis codes in it, the ICD-10 diagnosis codes, but it also identifies which procedures will actually be paid for those diagnosis codes. And I think that's something that many, many doctors uh, struggle with is knowing what, what procedure uh, I, I perform uh, was going to get paid for a specific diagnosis code that I find. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. ICD-10 was something that I think everybody was really afraid of when it first happened, and now we've kind of settled in a little bit, but there's still a lot to it. And, um, and one area that at least I've seen not enforced as much as what they said at first is the trauma codes. Can you touch a little bit on those um, expanded codes, the, the when and the how and the, you know, water skis caught on fire? And so, so right now... There, there's still a digit in those trauma codes that we don't have to fill. So it's really not all that complicated. The, the only thing you really have to do with trauma codes right now is determine whether or not it's an initial visit, uh, a subsequent visit, or a sequela visit. So obviously the initial visit is when you see them the first time. Uh, subsequent visit is any time you see them after the first initial visit where you're still treating the same problem. And the sequela visits are when the, the condition is completely healed up and, and resolved, and they come back at a later date with an issue that maybe is related to the original trauma. Okay. So right now we don't have to worry about coding that it was in the garage of the single family home. Do you think that's gonna be enforced down the line though? I think it'll come, yes. I think, I think they're using that information in some, some respect, maybe I, not, not how I would, would understand it or the average person would understand, but I'm sure they have their reasons. Um, so how can NOD, you know, really know how, how to code those when we get there? Is there somewhere that they can look for those ICD-10 codes that, you know, maybe are a little more obscure down the line? So, I mean, right now, um, you know, you can go to ICD-10data.com. You can, you, can, you can also Google a lot of the, the CPT codes. Um, the coding book there that I, that I gave you has a lot of the diagnosis codes and almost all the diagnosis codes in it that you use in optometric practice. So there's resources out there that you can use. Are there any other questions? That was a great one. Anybody else? No? Awesome. Well, is there anything you'd like to wrap up with? I think we've really covered quite a bit today. So the only thing I would really say is, is that, that, that you need to stay focused on is the fact that, that coding and billing is constantly changing. Whatever you're doing today, it could be different tomorrow, it could be different six months from now, it could be different a year from now. And I would encourage doctors that, that as much time as you spend on, on learning to, to uh, treat glaucoma or follow your diabetic patients or, or treat dry eye, as much time in, uh, that you put into getting educated on that, you, you need to put it into coding and billing as well uh, because the changes are there, the changes are there all the time. Um, you need to, to trust it to somebody who knows what they're doing. If that person is not in your office today, then, then you, you probably need to outsource your, your, your insurance 
uh, billing uh, because there, there's no better way to, to leave money on the table than to have examinations that are coded correctly, submitted incorrectly, and, and not paid. Uh, so stay on top of it. That's, that's my best advice. How do you find that person? You know, at, when you're interviewing, when you're sending out applications and resumes, how do you, how do you know that they know what they're doing? Well, if you have somebody who's, who's already trained and, and doing the, the, the billing, that's probably the best way. So unfortunately, what that means is you're going to steal them from the competition. Otherwise, you're going to hire the right person and then you're going to give them the right training. But I'll tell you, it doesn't happen overnight. You will not have an expert uh, biller in, 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 in a week or a month. It'll, it'll take time for them to understand it. So you're going to have to be patient and you're going to have to give them the time to, to, that they need to, to learn it. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're going to have this online for everybody to reference since that was a lot of information. If anybody needs to get a hold of me, my contact is patricia at covalentcareers.com. And if you don't mind giving a contact information, then we'll, sure, we'll get sure. in touch with you. So if you want to get a hold of me, uh, my email is, is uh, drvision at claimdoctor.net. Uh, so it's drvision at claimdoctor.net. Uh, claimdoctor.net, that's the website for, for my billing service and credentialing service and you can get a lot of information there as well great thanks everybody thank you